I just want to start by saying, I've been working with HIV AIDS since 86, and I, when I came, and so that was the only life I knew, right? So when I came back to, uh, to the country, uh, this was in the US, and when I came back to the country, it made perfect sense for me to continue doing what I was doing, which was advocacy and HIV AIDS prevention. That's what I knew with every drop of my blood in my body. And I was so clear that that's what I was going to do. And so advocacy is something I have believed in, and I believe all of us have the potential to change what we think is wrong. So the law that Danish spoke about uh, is the law that took up a decade of my life and uh, Naz's life, and we brought that change. It was possible, and it happened. Um, but you know, what really threw me for a six was something that I was completely not prepared for. I was an advocate. I was seen as an activist. Um, and I had never thought of children. I'm a single woman, never thought of a family, never thought about being alone, because that was not part of my thinking. And in 2000, um, the strangest thing happened. Nas used to operate out of my home because we really didn't have the resources, so my parents were really supportive and said, okay, okay, do what you have to do, but just make sure you do it. Uh, so it was running out of my home. And a little kid, all of four years old, with most gorgeous big eyes, was left at the office. And the only thing we knew is that he had an older sibling who was negative, was adopted by an uncle in the family. Um, his parents had died of HIV. He himself was HIV positive. And um, the uncle who brought him in uh, was a lawyer. I never met this man, I've never spoken to him. And I was like, that means they're fairly educated or well off, you know, I'm just thinking in my head. And I went to berserk, because I didn't know what to do with the child. I definitely never saw myself as a maternal person. I was not a mother. But children have a strange way of changing things for you, you know. So I um, said, now what do I do? So I went nuts, calling every agency I could think of, government, non-government, take this child. And every time they got to know he was HIV positive, the doors were shut one by one. So I said, all right, enough is enough. We'll take care of this child. What's the big deal? So I'm, I just thought it's common sense to take care of someone, right? So that's how it started. And over a period of time, obviously, we got more and more kids. And I got into a lot of trouble from many sides. I was told by major donor agencies, you're doing a really wrong thing by starting an institution. So I'm like, what are you talking about? They said, oh, well, you know, you should stick to advocacy. You need to change the system. And my question, it, it just came out like this. I said, while we are changing the system, what do we do with those who really need the care? So we need to do something for them. These are children, highly vulnerable. So I'm like, all right, I'm not asking you for money. Just let me do what I have to do. Because what happens, I agree, communities must respond. Absolutely agree, com communities must respond. But what happens to those who don't have those communities? What happens, you don't have parents. The, our criteria is very clear. You have to be HIV positive because no one will take you if you're HIV positive. You should not have any parents and no extended family support. So if that's the reality, where would these children go? So anyway, this, you won't believe it, this four-year-old, and the other question was, what's the point? There's so many kids who need this, and you're only taking care of 30-odd? So I'm like, all right, guys, I am not going to look at the big picture. Because very often, the big picture can paralyze you. And that is why many of us, including me, have not done many things in our lives we could have done, because we were paralyzed by the thought that the problem was too huge. I think, I really, really, and I really want you to believe this, all of us has that potential to take care of at least one soul in our lives. Just do it. Don't let what anyone says stop you from do it, doing it. The third thing I was told was, what's the point? These kids, how long are they going to live? Listen, we don't know. I could walk out of here and get hit by a bus. What's the big deal? But the, it, but, but the reality today is, with the kind of drugs we have available, children are living much longer. Our oldest one is going to be nearly 20. 
the, the, the little one who was left with us, you will not believe it. You know what he's doing today? He's studying to be an engineer. He's this absolutely gorgeous, strapping young man. And I feel so sad for that uncle. I feel so sad for that family who never even called once to find out if he was dead or alive. I can't, I, it's beyond my understanding human beings sometimes. But all I want to say is that I think I am one of those lucky few who went from being a single woman with an incredibly extended family, which I think many of us would love to have. So all I'm saying is, guys, just do what it is that you dream of doing. Don't give up on it. Thank you.